pleased to welcome all of you to the 2009 Belusky Professorship Lecture. Before I introduce uh, Michael Piatok, our speaker this evening, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this endowed visiting professorship and the architect who made it possible. Uh, every year, uh, because of the generosity of Pietro and Belusky and his family, the department has the opportunity to invite a distinguished practitioner who teaches a design studio and a theory seminar to our um, intermediate and advanced types of architecture. But it is very much uh, in recognition of uh, Pietro Belusky's career that we do this. And, and every year we like to just remind ourselves of the importance of this work. So I know that many of you have heard of the man and know quite a lot about him, but for those of you who are maybe new to our community, I'm going to give you a little bit of information. <coughs> architect Pietro Belusky of Portland was the most important architect to have lived and worked in Oregon. He was known for establishing a Northwest regional style as well as modern innovations, but he believed his most important works were his religious buildings. Belusky, born in 1899 in Italy, was trained as an engineer in Rome and later at Cornell. In 1925, he moved to Portland and joined the office of A.P. Doyle. By 1927, at the age of 28, Belusky had become the firm's leading designer. There were three major phases of his career. First, he was a Northwest regionalist. Uh, he worked within the influences of Frank Lloyd Wright and the Arts and Crafts movement. His national phase began in 1951 when he became the dean of the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT. And during this time, he collaborated with many architects, including Walter Gropius. Uh, he also frequently collaborated with the artist Gregory Kepish. And uh, he entered his third major phase of his career in 1973 when he returned to Portland to continue his work as an architect, a collaborator, and consultant. In 1972, he received the American Institute of Architects' highest honor, the Gold Medal for Lifetime Achievement. And in 1991, he was awarded the National Medal of Arts by President George Bush in a White House ceremony. Belusky was one of only two architects who received that award. He died at the age of 94 in his Portland home in February of 1994. Uh, joining him in making this gift to the school uh, was his widow, Marjorie Belusky, who died in that very same home just a few months ago. And so I did want to especially recognize Marjorie this evening. She will be very much famous. And so, in celebration and recognition of Pietro Belusky, I'm very pleased to introduce a good colleague, Michael Kayatok, and I want to tell you just a few words about him before we hear about his take on the U.S. housing crisis and the role of design in addressing that crisis. Michael Kayatok is a graduate of Harvard University's GSD, where he received his Master of Architecture and Pratt Institute School of Architecture, where he received his Bachelor of Architecture degree. He's been an architect and a professor of architectural design for 42 years. His practice serves nonprofit organizations, private developers, government agencies, and universities in building market rate, affordable housing, mixed use developments, and community facilities. Since opening his office in 1984, he's designed over 35,000 units of affordable housing for lower income households in the U.S., another 5,000 in the Philippines, and 1,500 in Malaysia. High Top Architects has won over 150 local and national design awards for their housing designs. Harvard University appointed Michael as a low fellow in 1983, where he used the resources of the Business School and the Kennedy School for Public Policy to explore strategies for affordable housing in this age of shrinking public involvement. I have always especially enjoyed Michael's take on, on concepts related to cost and value, combining uh, ideas about economics with ideas about social justice. I'm sure uh, we'll have some very interesting remarks tonight. Please join me in welcoming Michael Hyde. 
footsteps. Uh, when I was asked to talk about uh, my work, uh, I always try to put it in a larger social and economic context, which frames the way housing gets designed and produced in this country. And so I plan to do that tonight. And, and I'm showing an array of projects that build in density. And part of that is to demonstrate the purposes of our work is to try to prove to Americans that not only is affordable housing for low income uh, residents a value to their communities, certainly a value to the residents, but that Americans raising children can do so at high densities. It does not have to be the single family detached house or even townhome developments. And we can get as high as 150 to the acre or even more if we carefully think through how to organize the place so that it's, it works socially for the, for the families and especially for the kids. So I'm going to gradually build up in that bench to get to the end where we leap off at 150 per acre. Yes, is the mic on? I don't know. It's supposed to be. Is it on? And you, you, have, you can't hear me in the back? You hear me okay? So we don't need the mic. And let's see if this works. Okay, it does. So in starting out, before we start looking at any of the housing designs, I just wanted to remind you of the economic conditions of this country, which has obviously worsened in the last year. But I think the most graphic portrait, I won't look at the, the cylinders on the left. Let's just look at the one on the right. That big blue mass represents 85% of the wealth of the country. It's in the hands of 15%. It's owned by 15%. That really thin sliver of a red line that you see at the bottom, barely perceived in that overall red line, that tiny thin sliver, and I'll point it out, you may not hear, that, that is not a borderline of this box. That represents the wealth that's owned by 40% of the population. So it poor. It's pretty shocking numbers. <laughs> um, so of all the industrialized countries, this is the most unjust in the way its economic resources get distributed. And so most of the people that we provide our housing for are in that 40%, who virtually have no stake in owning anything uh, of, of any portion of America's wealth. Uh, in fact, what comprises that thin line actually is some home ownership. There's, there's, there's home ownership at that bottom 40%. Um, and the rest of it is automobiles, refrigerators, and other consumer durables, so-called durables. That's it. That's what they own. So it's pretty shocking. Oh, there we go again. That's high up. Uh, just looking at the cylinders there, that front cylinder that represents about 35% of the wealth, that's in the hands of 1% of the population. And the next cylinder back is the next 4%. And then the next cylinder back is the next 5%. So that top 10%, you can see a huge, huge amount of the wealth is in the hands of that, really a handful of people. So that is what really is framing the so-called housing crisis. People, it's not a housing crisis. It's a distribution of wealth and income crisis. People are not earning at the capacity they should be for the labor that they contribute to the building of that wealth. They're not receiving their fair portion of it. So they can't compete in the marketplace housing, which is the highest, most expensive thing that they need to purchase or rent uh, in order to survive. Or another way of looking at it, we were just talking about distribution of wealth. Now we're talking about income distribution. If you look at the chart on the left, we all read the newspapers. CEO incomes have increased by over 300% in the last 15 years. They're astronomical. That's not even counting the bonuses that they get for bringing down the global economy. And the average worker's income has only increased by 4% during that period. And anyone on minimum wage, their buying power has actually dropped by about 9%. So it's pretty grim. It's pretty grim. Compared to the rest of the industrialized world, we're the worst in the way we distribute our, our wealth and compensate um, our citizens for their, for their hard work. Uh, the racial injustice is another overlay on that. The average uh, white household, um, their net worth is about 20 times that of the average uh, African-American household. 
15 million US households there on the left and how they stack up, 75 to 80% are households with no children and about 25 to 30% uh, are households with children. So the majority of the households are singles and couples, either pre-kid age or post-kid age. And they're earning the overwhelming majority of the income. They're earning the lion's share of that income. You would think that the smaller the household, the less the income. No, the smaller the household, the greater the income per person. So those families that are trying to raise kids are actually earning only about 20% annually of the all that is earned by people's uh, labor. So it's not a particularly family-friendly or kid-friendly economic order that we live in, regardless of what the Republicans claimed it to be during their years in power. It's not a family-friendly system at all. And if you look at the numbers of households, uh, families, that have only single parents, it's almost 40% now of the households that are raising kids have only one parent uh, in charge of those kids. Maybe on the weekends they see the other one. Um, and if you look at the distribution of the income for those households that have only one parent, they're only getting about 5% of the annual income earned by all households. And they usually are households with a larger number of kids and only one parent. So there's a gross injustice in the way income is distributed, and the most of that burden is being borne by the households who are trying to raise kids, and the biggest portion of that burden is by the single parent households. And that's who predominantly we end up serving with our affordable family housing um, for the nonprofits who, nonprofit housing corporations who are primarily our clients. So what do we do in the face of that enormous, enormous difficulty? We can't change it, we're architects, you know, we design the environment. Um, but there is a role for good design when faced with the task of designing housing for people of these modest, modest incomes. There is a political role too. We have a lot of convincing to do of the broader population out there that this is worth the investment on the part of the government, which is really taking money from some and making it available to others. It's a very, very tiny redistributive role in a sense that's being played here by government housing programs. One is that it is good for the larger and the local economies. And in certain regions of the country, the business community, the enlightened business community, recognizes that it's in their best interests that government money flow into the hands of their workers to pay for their housing because it takes the pressure off of them to have to raise wages in order for their workers to compete in the ever-rising, escalating costs of, of the housing market. So enlightened businessmen know it's a good thing for them in the long run to have money pumped into housing for their workers. Because these are businesses that have to compete on the national and an inter international marketplace, competing with countries whose labors, labor is, is far cheaper than ours, even at our lowest ends. So it's good for the local economy. Uh, it's good for the social order, because the, more that, the less that people have to pay on their housing, the less they have to move around in search of cheap housing. It stabilizes the family, and the kids can go through school, K through 12, without ever leaving their neighborhood. Extremely important for their development versus conditions where families who are paying 50, 60, 70% of their income on housing are forced to move constantly, year to year, sometimes t twice in one year, as they get evicted or pushed out by rising, by rising rents. So it stabilizes the family, it stabilizes the kids and their education, and that can't help but be good for the uh, uh, stability of the social order. Uh, it's good for the environment, because all the projects, and you'll see tonight, they're all built at, in more compact conditions at higher densities, smaller dwellings. The average dwelling size that we produce is about 950 square feet as an average between our two and three bedroom units. And that's exactly what the average square footage of a home was in the United States in 1950. The average home now is 2,400 square feet. So we have SUVized our dwellings just like we did our cars and our museums and churches and whatever else has been oversized. So it's been good for the environment. Higher densities, smaller dwellings, close into infrastructure and transit, walkable distances to the services and retail that's needed to support the families. So they've been green without ever knowing it, that is the nonprofit uh, housing developers, until it's now fashionable for everybody else to start thinking about 
because they have to given the price of oil and other, and other uh, things like rising oceans. <coughs> it's good for property values. It's been demonstrated that this kind of housing, when well done, not only does it not detract from local property values, in many instances it actually begins to spur them because the quality of the housing being produced is better than, than what's in the immediate uh, environment. But certainly when it's injected into middle and upper income communities, it does not subtract from the property values. If anything, an empty lot is now put to active economic and social good use, and if it's well managed, it will look as good as the market rate housing in the area. <coughs> It's good for the residents and for the neighbors. The neighbors, of course, benefit, and, and lower income neighbors, they benefit from the fact that the vacant lot is no longer vacant and rat infested and full of broken down couches. It's now actually occupied by residents who are contributing to their, to their uh, community. And uh, if it's built into a, a middle income neighborhood, uh, those folks begin to, and their kids begin to meet a wider diversity of folks, both through the schools and on the streets of their communities. So they benefit from that richness and that cultural diversity. And then finally, the cultural legacy. This is an important one, because we try with our work to engage artists from the locality in helping to make the place a landmark, a cultural landmark, more than just housing, more than just architecture, but something that even in its earliest stages is looked upon as that thing is something that 30 years from now when it has to get renovated or the choice is there between renovating it and tearing it down, they will not tear it down because the neighborhood will have become the The NIMBYs are at it. <laughs> what did I do? Is that, oh, maybe that's my, I didn't turn off my, maybe it's this guy, my Blackberry. It's uh, home calling me. Yeah, I'm turning it off. You think that was it? Um, yeah, so, so making these places in such a way with such a level of charm and richness, uh, design richness, that people really feel it's a special place. And 30, 40 years out, they will not tear it down. And that's probably the best way of making a sustainable development, is that all that embodied energy is not thrown away just 30 years out in a world where buildings are around for centuries. We throw them away in three or four decades. <clears throat> so the better designed it is, the more likely it is it won't be torn down. And monies will be found to renovate it for the next time around. Four other issues that we have to, sorry for all the tech slides. There will be pictures, sorry. Um, there are some myths that we have to dispel with each project that we design. And one is that they can't live, families can't live at higher densities. So you're gonna see that as a theme running through the projects that they in fact can. That the rental housing is not as good as ownership housing. Uh, that's a myth we try to dispel. The quality of our housing looks as good as any market rate condos in the area. <clears throat> and it also helps dispel the myth that renters are second class citizens compared to homeowners. And if you look at the statistics of any of our major cities, the majority of the residents are renters, not homeowners. Our most creative cities, or the ones that are considered to have the biggest creative class. New York City, 80% of them are renters. Chicago and LA, 60% or more. So these major cities are dominated by renter households, not owner households. Ownership means you now have an albatross around your neck for the rest of your life, and you're gonna be very conservative in your behavior because you don't wanna mess it up and foreclose on your mortgage. So it has a, conserving, a conservative influence on your behavior. I think it diminishes people's creativity, owning a home. So they gotta take that. <laughs> I'm a homeowner. <laughs> and a landlord, I rent out my second floor, so I'm a landlord too. <clears throat> and two other important issues that, run, uh, strains of thinking that run through our work, two major tasks is organizing and then designing. The organizing work at the front end of any project is really important because we have to engage the neighbors and potential residents in the direct process of designing the facility. So we don't touch pencil to paper until we have that kind of direct input. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a moment. And collaborative design, it's a way of saying that we also want in the room with the residents and the neighbors, those who might potentially be regulating the 
the, this development that is providing its passage uh, through the entitlement process. So we want the planners in there at least to witness what's going on when the residents and, and the neighbors are talking about what they'd like to see. Because often we are doing things, or they want to do things, that are outside the codes, outside the zoning codes. And we're going to need to seek variances. And if the planners are in there watching and listening, this is not something we make up. It's coming from the people themselves that they're willing to ask for these variances for this design to be incorporated into their community. And then the designing, two kind of themes that run through the work. We really often have to design to fit the context. This is not just lip service. This is serious stuff. There's, if there's one building type that has to respond to the conservative pressures of what homeowners think domesticity is supposed to look like, it's housing, rental housing in particular. Because what we're doing is we're introducing into these neighborhoods that are usually dominated by the homeowners. Even if it's a majority renter neighborhood, the only ones who show up at the Planning Commission City Council meetings are the homeowners. They control, they're the gatekeepers. And so we have to please them, we have to satisfy them, we have to push their cultural buttons of what they think domesticity is supposed to look and feel like. There's no way getting around it. And so architecturally, if it means we have to put on a, a blue blazer and penny loafers and nicely crisped iron pants and a nice striped preppy looking tie, architecturally, that's what we'll do. Because what we've done is we've brought into their neighborhood housing that is four times the density of the local neighborhood and for people whose incomes are half of what the local neighbors are earning on an annual basis. So those are two major cultural shifts. And if it means it has to be brought in a Trojan horse, we'd make a Trojan horse. But at the same time, we have to personalize. We have to give opportunities for the people who live there to do their thing. Um, uh, particularly in these coastal regions and southern regions, these cities are gateways for people who are coming from all over the world. And they do things differently. They're coming from different cultures and they need to have that opportunity to do their thing. Up to about 30 dwelling units to an acre, most housing can have a front and a back. And with the back side, you can design it so people can do their thing, as long as the front side is photogenic for those neighbors and those controlling interests of, of the neighborhood. So you can do this front and back dichotomy uh, between the, the here and now folks who live in the neighborhood and the newcomers who can take care of the back side. After 30 units an acre, there are no backsides. Everything's on display to everybody in the neighborhood, and then you have to really be careful about what you, uh, what you do. I usually call that the schmaltz and the schmutz of architecture, for those who know Yiddish. The schmaltz is the front side. You appeal to all the nostalgia of the neighbors. And then the schmutz is the back side, where you let your hair down and do what you want to do, because you're out of the eyes of the neighbors. And two important concepts in housing design, schmaltz and schmutz. <laughs> Residential house, schmaltz and schmutz. Um, some images of these kinds of workshops, you've seen lots of examples of this sort of thing. We take it very seriously, and, and if there are 60 to 100 people, which is generally the, the, the size groups that we work with, we organize them into groups of 10, so the 6 to 10 groups, and each one is given a set of mo a modeling kit that includes all the ingredients that that nonprofit developer feels it needs to include on that site. The numbers of units, the open space, the number of parking spaces, any non-residential uses that might be in the mix, a child care center, community center, clinic, that's all in, in the mix. And each of the teams get those ingredients and they get a site model and there's a larger model of the neighborhood so they can each explore options in their teams. And then at the end of the, the workshop, they, they present to each other their options for the evening. And they elect a spokesperson and each of the spokespersons presents the ideas in that group. We talk them through, we find out which ones everyone agrees to, which ones they agree they don't like, and we gradually build a consensus. And we have workshops for three major sets of decisions. The site planning, because that's really critical, how that stuff weaves together is shaping the social life, in some ways, of that new community, and it also shapes its ability to interconnect and tie into the existing neighborhoods. So site planning is 100% of the design task of housing. The other 100% of the design task of housing is the unit planning. Um, how the houses are going to get organized because we are dealing with three generations, four generations. We are dealing with folks who work out of their homes, not in front of computer screens, but they're making and repairing things. They're doing semi-industrial work out of their homes. So we have to take that into account at times. And then the other 100%, so there's 
to do any housing. The other 100% is what is it going to look like? Because that's all that the neighbors will know, and the broader public, and the photographers, and the newspapers, they never go inside and talk to the people or look at the, they just look at the skin and the form. And so that's very important too. Um, and we have to, as I said, appeal to the neighbors. We have to appeal to the cultural origins of the people that we're working with. And we have our own subcult that we belong to. And it is a cult. You're going through a, a cult schooling right now. It may take you years to, to get out of the brainwashing that you're going through right now. <laughs> but we have our desires of what we want to do in, in our efforts to be contemporary. Um, we even train people to believe there's a higher moral order if you're a modernist, and if you're not, you're somehow a lowlife. So we have that in our blood, even if we don't want to admit it, and we want to somehow include that thinking in the work, along with all the other pressures. Here's some more examples of these kinds of workshops, and the two at the bottom are showing these kinds of discussions that occur at the end, where people from each of their groups are presenting. Uh, I did want to dwell just for a minute at the start. We'll start with some case studies that talk about live work. And I know Howard's doing a book on this right now, and I can't wait to see it. It's something that I've dreamed about for years. And then Howard told me about a year, a year ago that he was doing it, and I was all excited. I can't wait to get his book. Um, if the two, the upper left and the lower right images, are from cities in, in the United States, they're actually they're both from Oakland, home-based businesses. The one in the upper left is a corner convenience store. Mr. Cooper and his son run this corner convenience store. It's obviously not built to building code. It's definitely not conforming to zoning code. But they can get away with it, because it's in a poor neighborhood. And the zoning police aren't around. There are no wealthy or middle class homeowners to moan and groan about such a creation. And so they can run their little business there, serving their surrounding neighborhood. And the guy on the lower right is a sheet metal fabricator. And he runs a business out of his first floor and his, his garage. Uh, doing sheet metal fabrication as a subcontractor. The other two images that I show are from um, Hanoi, which is one of the few, uh, well, you know, the capital city, one of the few remaining so-called so state-controlled uh, socialist or communist regimes, and yet it has more small-scale capitalist entrepreneurial activity than any U.S. city that I know, because as you walk through the streets, particularly the old section of Hanoi, as you see these images, um, lining both sides of the street every two, three, and four meters, which is the width of the properties, are workshops producing something. So there's about 20 on each side, so you get about 40 of these family-based workshops. You're walking through a factory floor when you walk down one of these streets, and each is dedicated to a different type of business. So one street is women's shoes, another street is rubber stamps. Uh, another street is men's pants. Another street is ductwork and sheet metal. Another street is uh, cabinetry, and so on down the line. Anything conceivable that we make, there's a street for it. And it's got all these shops lining it on both sides, and two, three, and four, five stories of housing above it. So it's true mixed use. And family-based business. We don't allow that with our zoning anymore. We zone these things out, and we, our building codes don't permit it. But if you look back in our history, when we were pioneers, you had to work at a house. When we were colonists, we had to work at a house. Because there was no system in place there to do it for us. And even immigrants at the turn of the century were finding ways, and immigrants always find ways, to make that additional income to survive. And they used their dwelling in one way or another to, uh, as, as the source of that, of that income. We've made it very difficult, though, for that bottom 40%. That's how we hold them in that tiny sliver. They can't build wealth because the residential codes don't permit it. But here was an example where we were able to do it. This is 25 to the acre. This first time homeowner housing for families at 60 to 80% of the area's median income. We went through that workshop process. There were three auto courts that they developed with about 18 families per auto court. And these, um, the houses that they developed, if I could point to the one over here. Ah, okay. Is the reason for the laser. In this house type, by the way, you can see there are core houses with expandable attics, just like Levitt did. So you can add two bedrooms and a bathroom up there. And then the carport on the side, which you get a glimpse of over here, can eventually be built out as a garage with another room on top, another bedroom. So you can eventually have, really have a five-bedroom house here. And some of the house types and plan 
included ones that had a bedroom on the ground floor right off the front foyer along with the garage once it's built could be a home-based business and it could actually expand for outdoor use in, in the back. So you can keep the family car in the apron, your pickup truck in here, and then the cement mixer or, or any other hauling device that you have back there with all your tools can be in the backyard. And that could be your clean room where you, you do I really need this? Or do you need it for the recording of it? Because it, it, okay, all right. Um, and so that's where you can so, uh, do your taxes and keep your records if, you know, if you're reporting it to the IRS. And then the kitchen dining is in the back, the living room's on the second floor with a bedroom and bath, and then the attic can get two more bedrooms and another bath. And in this particular house, what did I do? In this particular house, you see, that's what happens in a business school auditorium. <laughs> if you were in the architecture school, you wouldn't have these problems. <laughs> they put all their money into their bonuses. They can't get, you know, really good equipment. <laughs> and this house, down on the ground floor, um, there's a bedroom with a handicap accessible bathroom, and that's for uh, the grandparents or the working son and daughter who can't own their own apartment or rent their own apartment, they can still live at home and hopefully put money into the, into the family household. And they're right off the back door, so they can come and go at will, and then they're right off the kitchen, so they can come and go from the refrigerator at will as well. <laughs> two more bedrooms upstairs, and then again in the attic, you can get two more. So the party wall is here, and that in the attic, these windows are in the unfinished attic. And almost within the first year, all the attics were put to use. And a few of the carports have been now made into uh, garages. Here's another example. Uh, this was on a parcel that was partly in Oakland, partly in the city of Emeryville. And this centerpiece is owned by the county because there's an underground creek. We worked with the neighbor. The neighbor was really upset with a drug dealing liquor store that used to be here and with an abandoned gas station that was there. So they got the two cities to cooperate, put in a few million dollars, buy out the liquor license, tear down, that, tear down the, the station, clean up the soil, and made it available to a nonprofit developer because no for profit developer would deal with a site that has three jurisdictions and it's only uh, two thirds of an acre. And a very angry, collaborating neighborhood that's watching everything. Uh, that's going to go on there. So the nonprofit took it on, hired us to work with the community to, to come up with a solution. And everyone recognized that on this boulevard that has 30,000 cars a day, you can see it here across the street is the, is the high school, the town's high school, Emeryville High School. Not much retail there anymore, some offices, but big box retail exists 10 blocks away. So you couldn't support retail on the ground floor. But they recognized that there could be some home based businesses. So they developed a unit type that had a double height flex space in the front. You could live in that or you could use it as a business. But if you were to live in it, we weren't sure which way it was going to go. We built out in front of these units sound walls that have windows in them. So there's some sense of connection to the street, uh, but at the same time you can get your, your privacy in there and top them off with, with trellises and vines. A couple of the units come right out to the front as real bona fide retail spaces and they're, they're, they're bigger bigger units than these. They come out all the way to here. And then in the back side is where you get the auto court where the people hang out, kids play, and it's wide enough at 30 feet so you can plant trees in it. This was on opening day, but those trees now, it's, this thing is a dozen years old, they've filled out the whole space now. and you, It looks like an arbored way and not, this, not really a, a, a driveway. Uh, so the front is kind of a harder edge. We had some artists do these murals to uh, memorialize the creek that's in an aqueduct down 15 feet down below. From years ago, it's been there. We couldn't do anything about that. Um, and then the back begins to morph into these house-like units because we're up against a single-family neighborhood uh, behind. So that's at about 35 to the acre. Here's another one at 35 to the acre. This is a, a Hope 6 project that we just completed. It was an industrialized uh, piece of land. There was, there was industry on it and about 200 units of public housing built around 1960. And two little snippets of parks, one here and one there. So we aggregated all the land for the parks in the one central place, 
we pulled it down to the south so it would connect up with the existing neighborhood and not just be surrounded by the new neighborhood. And actually what it does, it also forces the streets to bend and slows down the, the drug dealers who are escaping the police or cruisers or industrial trucks trying to get through the neighborhood. Forces, it's a form of traffic control. You have to make a deliberate stop here to make a right or a left. You can't just go flying through because there's a tot lot right here. So, and the way we achieved that, we put townhouses above flats. These are townhouses above flats, townhouses above flats, townhouses above flats. And we get 35 to the acre without having to depend on elevators, corridors, or fire stairs. And that's what we are attempting to do all along this journey as we go higher and higher in density is not depend on those things because kids in those things mix too well. And they become mischievous and unsupervised and they get deconstructed in no time at all. So we try to get the densities to go up and up without having to depend on those, those uh, devices. And that's how we achieved it here. And so we get these alternating uh, auto courts. That's a, that's a pedestrian entrance, auto court, pedestrian court, auto court, pedestrian court, and so on down the rows. We did it here and here. And you'll s I'm, I'm gonna be showing you this one and then phase three. So here are some of the pedestrian courts with the townhouses above flats, about 45 feet across. And then the auto courts in the back where the townhouses above have these big outdoor rooms above, above the carports. We can't afford garage doors and, and they can't afford to maintain them. And we could not afford decent pavement in here like you saw in the previous one, so it ends up being asphalt. So it feels more like a car realm rather than the kid play realm, which is really what it becomes. Everybody knows the kids in their trikes and, and uh, skateboards and inline skates, whatever with wheels, they play in this court and not in the grassy court in the front. And these are secured uh, auto courts so people can't break in. But they do anyway. They come through the garbage. That's another whole story. You can ask me about that in a question and answer. And then phase three, which faced the industrial area to the north, it's a different kind of architecture because we don't have that pressure to domesticate it as much as we did on the southern end when it was next to the existing older, older neighborhood. But once again here, we, we begin to scale it down. The same way we scale it down here, so about 20 families per courtyard. Uh, same thing here, on top of this garage, we have clusters of four townhomes per for grouping. And then we have a central muse that's private to these 85 families and then another 20 families over here with their own courtyard. These are the threes and fours. So this is really a baby farm. This is really a high density. This one is twos and threes. One side faces the street, the other side faces the park. And the sunscreens that we originally had on the south side got value engineered out and we're waiting for the, for the trees to grow to, to screen it. But again, we have townhouses over flats on, on this side and townhouses over the parking on this side. And those clusters of four townhomes above the garage, which you see here, have a porch and stoop from the street as well as a porch and stoop from the central mews, and then two-story townhomes above the flats. So we're now at, in this one actually, we're closer to about 40 to 45 per acre. No elevators, no cars, I mean, uh, no corridors, no need for fire stairs. And when these folks have a public stair that comes up to the townhouses here, there's only one stair for every two units. So again, it's more intimate. People get to know each other and know who's responsible, whose kids are using that stair. If something gets happens to that stair, you know, it's the kids next, it's either your kids or the kids next door. So there are some of the pictures uh, depicting the, the, the muse. Here's a stoop and porch that goes up to that courtyard for four townhomes above. Here's another example of it. And then on this side, we have the townhomes above the flat. So a family is either on grade or one flight up. And you can get 40 units to the acre. Some more examples of the muse. 40, actually this says 40 to the acre. My staff corrected me. It's 52 to the acre. No elevators, no corridors, no fire stairs. It's on a hillside in Tacoma, 20 foot drop from one side to the other. And we had two sites to, to work with, about 75 families. Uh, townhomes above flats on this side and townhomes on top of townhomes 
That's a townhome wrapping around the garage. And then townhomes above that. And a townhome here above parking. And that parking is just in this zone. And then the rest of the area is above flat. So a family only has to walk up one flight to get from the central courtyard play area. And from the alley, they walk up only one flight to get to this house here, and then up another flight to get to that house there. So you never have to walk up more than two flights from your car, and one flight for the kids to get to the central play area. And along that central, uh, that upper strip uh, among the townhomes, there are these cutaways so that people who walk in the, in the public realm along the street can, can, see the, can still see the views. Uh, down at the alley level, they call them courts in Tacoma. They have 40 foot wide right of ways. It's really interesting as a street type. And, and they're, they're never occupied. Traditionally, they were just the garage backsides. And so we intentionally occupied it with the lower townhomes. There's the garage entry for eight cars per garage. Another scaling down that takes place both at the garage level and the cluster of homes. Again, you're trying to re get things to be more intimate. You'd never make a garage, or you try to avoid to make it. In the previous one you saw, we did have a garage for 80 families. If we had a, a, a Druthers, we would make two 40-car garages or three 25-car garages so that you're getting uh, more accountability as to who's coming in and out of that um, uh, gate and, and who might be in your garage. And we brought life to the alley. The police originally wanted us to gate up these porches and these stairs that lead up the hill to the central court that you see over here. Um, and we talked them uh, into not doing that <coughs> using the jargon of crime, uh, is it SIPTED, crime prevention through environmental design. You know, it's a fancy word for common sense on how to... families, so these are all one bedroom units, and they open directly out into the back court so you can bring stuff in and out of your cars. And the back play area is all fused with the parking areas because the kids are going to play in both. So there's no, no curb separation, no um, tire stops, it's just one big field of play surface and you separate them with the trees and bollards. And the cars come in through these innocent two car garage doors, one on this side, one on that side. And it disguises the fact that there's parking for 24 cars back in there. And you line all the edges with the dwellings. Townhouses, townhouses above the garage, and in this case, townhouses above the community room, and townhouses above flats. More examples, they did three sites along that street. Again, uh, a garage door between these two townhomes, and that garage door is feeding 24 cars into the development of 24 units. The bigger uh, one bedrooms uh, with the taller ceilings and, and bigger windows for the artists. And then the families live above. And this was a smaller site down the street. Same principles. 50 to the acre for families in a downtown location right next to a bus terminal. So this is transit related housing as the bus terminal. It was really just um, about 0.9 or 0.8 acres and we had to put uh, 40 units here. But they still required us to include 1.5 cars per unit, even though we're right next to the bus station. And we're right downtown. This is California thinking. 
and a child care center for 40 kids and, a, um, and their playground. All of that has to be on grade by licensing requirements. So the only, this is the first time that you're gonna see an elevator in the sequence thus far, and that elevator just goes from the garage level, here it is, from the garage level to the garden podium level. And you can avoid taking the elevator, you can take this stair that will bring you up to, to the garden level. Again, no corridors because these are all townhomes sitting on top of flats. Townhomes sitting on top of flats, in this case on top of the child care center. And there's that little court entry, which you see here. You could take the stair up one flight, so you don't even have to use the elevator. Um, and then you could take the elevator up the one story to the garden level. These are some of the surrounding um, street scenes. And then uh, up in the back, you have a courtyard, it's car free, of course, because you're on top of the garage. And you can see the uh, two-story townhouses above the flats, and the stair up starts here, and the one stair for every, every, two, every two units. Comfortable living, uh, living environments for families, 55 to the acre. Now we have to get more serious about elevators and double loaded corridors and fire stairs. But in that community group, they recognized fairly early on that the front buildings that face the boulevard that need the elevators and the fire stairs and the corridors could be for all the one bedroom units and some of the two bedroom units. So you have your smallest household, fewest number of kids occupying the, those buildings that require these gizmos in order to work. All the families in the three bedroom and four bedroom houses are in the back in their own houses, their own cottages, if you will, in the back. So there are 45 families in the back cottages and about another 47 ones and twos in the front elevator served buildings. And the same principles of compartmentalization exist here as I've been promoting elsewhere. There are actually two buildings here in the front with about 20 to 22 units each each with their own lobby and elevator. So they had their own separate secured entrances. And then behind them, the clusters of townhomes are also organized into two separate groupings of about 20 to 25 families each. And at the top of the stairs, where you enter them, they have a, a, a secured gate. All of the people who come and go from the place have to come through that central secured gate. So you buzz them in there, and then they still have to get buzzed into one of four separate entry points to this, these compartmentalized pieces of the development. And I often use the analogy of the ship of a, the hull of a ship. It's divided into a series of compartments, so if one gets punctured, the water doesn't get everywhere. So if somebody breaks in here, who's up to no good, they can't get into the other four, or other three departments or compartments. They only get into that one. So you have a way of controlling the, the, uh, the crime. And people, once they realize that this place is well secured in this manner, you're not going to commit a crime there. You go elsewhere. And then on the street frontier, for the first two years, we had, we had a ground floor retail, a, a, a child care center, a community center, and a kind of big incubation hall for businesses. This is about 8,000 square feet in here for small businesses who would rent 100 to 300 square feet to startup businesses. And across the front, we set back the glass five feet and had these roll down doors to, cr uh, to allow for street vendors, really cheap uh, storefronts. It lasted about two years because we're about four or five blocks off center from the real pedestrian intensive retail district out in, in East Oakland, this part of East Oakland called the Fruitvale neighborhood. And so the street vendors just had trouble surviving. And then the, the indoor, uh, ones then opened up to the to the outside. It's a long story because when we worked in the workshops, the vendors who were working on the site in an old um, grocery store liked the idea of just one way in and out because they, they felt secure. People couldn't rip them off. This is only one way to come in and out. When they're out on the street, there's a higher likelihood of being ripped off. So they led us to make the indoor market of 8,000 square feet with one way in and out, and we insisted on setting the glass wall back to create the opportunity for street vendors, because there are uh, vendors who don't mind being part of the street. They're not afraid of the street. Um, and of course, once the vendors failed after two years because they're too far off from the beaten path, all the guys on the inside wanted to open up to the outside because they didn't have enough exposure. 
So doors and, and, and more glass was inserted into those openings so that the indoor guys could get better connected this, to the street. A similar uh, a project, 55 to the acre in San Francisco at the corner of Chavez and Mission. Uh, again, the smaller households in the front, and then behind that is a village of family homes. And on the ground floor here, what's of interest is the family school and a child care center. So there's a, a social services for the families, for the adults. They get English as a second language. They get classes in nutrition, family counseling, child rearing practices, all kinds of stuff. And, and they get that during the day while their kids are across the way in a child care center. That's the main entrance to the housing. Uh, there's a passageway that goes back, uh, the passage is through here, into this lower courtyard. And then there's a garage underneath here with the family clusters on top of it. So you're getting 75 to the acre in the front of the ones and twos. You're getting uh, 35 to the acre in the middle with townhomes over flats. And then you get 10 to the acre in the back. Just in the back, you get a duplex, two four-bedroom flats stacked. And they're more or less the same size and texture and format of the houses on, uh, along that street. Here's the central family village in the middle of the block. This is an interesting uh, case of also 50 to the acre. It's a combination of housing above a clinic. And the clinic is run by the Native American uh, Health Center, and the housing is developed and run by the Asian, uh, an, Amer an Asian American nonprofit housing producer. So they formed a joint venture and developed a little sliver of two thirds of an acre of land uh, and packaged all of this stuff. There's a 40 car garage in there on grade because we couldn't afford to go underground. There is uh, a courtyard on grade for ceremonial uh, events and community meetings. There's another courtyard on top of the clinic for the housing that wraps around it. We had pressure from this historic landmark from 1880. The family that lives there are descendants of the original owners of the house. It's a federal landmark. And they did not want the housing to be very tall back here, so we had to shave it down to a lower height in the back, raise it up along the boulevard. So we have a number of cultural ingredients in this one that was very important to the Native American Health Center to give the Native American community a presence on the boulevard. About 3 to 4% of the population of Oakland is actually Native American from 90 different tribal uh, uh, tribes uh, around the country. So up the front is a steel, what we call it the steel feather, and a, a ceramic story pole. The development is called the Seven Directions. The chief who's in charge of the, of the board of directors of the medical center talked about the four cardinal points as four important directions. The heavens above and the earth below are two more, and then the path to the inner self as the seventh direction, all of which are important to understanding your place in the world, in the universe, and so the number seven became a critical uh, uh, number throughout. So we have seven, and the circle was another important ingredient. It occurs a lot in, in, in various indigenous tribes around the country. Um, and so we have seven circles in the plan. You'll see in a moment the waiting rooms, the reception room, the talking circle in the courtyard. And we have seven pairs of ribs in the feather that will eventually receive uh, prisms, glass prisms, so that when the sun comes around in the afternoon, it will shine seven rainbows across the facade. The, the feather is tilted at an angle right in the north-south axis, again, to remind people of the orientation of at least those two cardinal directions. So the shadows don't get start being cast on the building until right after noon. In the afternoon, they gradually grow longer and longer across the facade. And once we get the glass in there, we've got to raise another 12,000 for the, for the seven prisons. Uh, we'll have the rainbows on the facade. And then there's a medicine wheel at, at the base of it. That is the stair that accompanies the elevator in this lobby. That's the stair that allows people to avoid using the elevator and come up to the housing levels uh, up above. And red, yellow, black, and white are four colors that occur frequently across uh, uh, tribes uh, around the country. It's a, it's a recurring set of colors. There's some mythological stories associated with them that I don't fully understand, and, and, and I get various interpretations depending upon what tribe you talk to. Um, and then these came from basket weavings of the local Pomo, Pomo Indians. So the clinic is on the first two floors, housing above. 
There's a ceramic pole. The artist took seven myths about life and death uh, from seven different tribes and wove them into the uh, uh, mosaic on the column. <clears throat> this is actually a, a chant, a Navajo chant. In beauty, happily I walk with beauty uh, before, and happily I walk with beauty behind me, happily I walk. <clears throat> And then on the inside, when you enter, there's one of the seven circles. That's the medicine wheel, again, or oriented along the east, west, north, south axes with the grand stair that leads up to the clinic along with an elevator up to the clinic. But you have a straight shot view out to the courtyard. That's the courtyard in the back, at the center of which is the talking circle. And it, it radiates into the center of the, of, of the clinic on the ground floor. We have a speaker's podium halfway up the stairs at that landing and another cave underneath it for small group uh, discussion. Up on the second floor, there's the reception circle, the, medi the medical waiting, the dental waiting. They're called drums because they get reflected also in the, in the ceilings. And this passage is actually an exhibition gallery of arts and crafts for the uh, Native American community. And that ceiling cavity is going to get filled with 50 paper mache fish, fishes and birds, flying and swimming creatures all uh, moving towards the, uh, uh, the clinic entrance. Uh, they're going to be made by the children who are in a program called the M Museum of Children's Art in downtown Oakland. It's a great after school arts program. And they do these multicolored animals. Uh, and then these two steel poles are waiting to receive two totem poles that are being carved right now in Alaska by a, a member of the Tlingit tribe. There's a fifth generation totem pole carver. And here they are in, in progress about two months ago. He's a little behind schedule because he injured his foot in the works. But there they are in plan as they come into the central receiving of medical and dental and then the, the two waiting areas. And then finally, the seventh circle is the talking circle itself. That was very important to Marty Walker, who was the chief of the, set of the clinic. Um, he talked about the importance of the community getting together to talk through its problems and difficulties as a foundation for a healthy community, um, which is the foundation then for uh, solid mental and physical health for, for, the, uh, for the individual. <coughs> and it gets entered from the east side in many indigenous tribes, the entry to the home should be from the east uh, where the sun rises. On the north side is a bit of a dais for, for any speechifying that might occur within, within the group. And then on the back wall of, the, of this courtyard is um, a water wall, this stone that we got from Idaho. And it, water drips down it and plant life grows out of it. And gradually over the years, they will be making inscriptions on the stone, memorializing various important people that uh, made contributions to the clinic. And then the housing sits above it with its own courtyard on top of the clinic. And there are two courtyards because those folks in the, in the Victorian wanted no building at this corner. So it would not cut down on light of them. And it did not want any kids playing back here. So there's actually a gate, a locked gate so only adults can go back there. It's a contemplative adult courtyard. <laughs> to please the two guys who still live in this house, descendants of that family. And it's an interesting story, because when we met them before the project started, we walked up their driveway to kind of look at their backyard. It's a beautiful yard. And um, they came out with cowboy hats and, and the, this cowboy string ties. And we described, and I was with two members of Native American uh, members of the board of directors of the health center. We started talking about what we were going to do. And you could see in these guys' faces that they weren't too happy about what they were hearing because for at least their lifetimes, they were able to always see the setting sun coming through here. And they said as part of the federal landmark, not only is the building protected, but the open space must be preserved and all of its attributes like the setting sun. And then they said, and besides, we were here first. This house was built in 1880. And the, two, two mem the two Native American members of the board politely bit their tongues because I was waiting for them to, you know, <laughs> do away with these two cowboys. And they were very polite and gentlemanly about it and said, well, we'll see what we could do to satisfy your concerns. And they did. They, we, as I said earlier, 
The housing back at this end is only one story above the clinic, and then it turns to two stories, and then to three and four stories <coughs> up, up at this end. Here it is just two stories. You're looking at this wing, which is right over here. And, and there's the front, front building. So we appeased their concerns. We actually had to take four units out of the program. We dropped from 40 to 36. And we pushed three of those units down to the second floor, which you don't see here. So we had to give up 5,000 square feet in the clinic. So the clinic is 20,000 instead of 25,000. Because in addition to the medical and dental, there was supposed to be a WIC program, Women, Infants, Children program. And that had to get eliminated and it's still in one of the older buildings. So eliminating 5,000 from the clinic and taking out four units to satisfy the two cowboys. So I think they went a long way to be gentlemanly about who was here first. Um, this project we're just finishing construction on now. People have just begun to move in. It's 80 units to the acre. That's one acre, 80 units. It's part of a larger development of, oh, sorry. It's part of a larger development of mark 800 units of market rate housing centered around a park. And after a lot of advocacy and protesting, the advocates were able to get uh, this parcel set aside for very low income families. And we front right on the park. This is the competition that we won. And this is also divided into two groupings, 40 families in each, each with their own lobby and elevator core, uh, sitting on top of an 80 car garage uh, underneath. In section, we stack the townhouses, so there's only an elevator stop here and here coming up from the, from the garage. In the center, we have flats with the public stair up to two townhomes. And then on the top floor only do we have the double-loaded corridor in this one instance in the center uh, where the f uh, one bedrooms and studios are. So all the singles and young couples are up on the top floor of, of this wing of this grouping here, the North Court. And then down below, the families are either right at the courtyard level or two flights up. And this is actually an open uh, corridor that runs through here. On this side, they're on top of the child care center, so you start with child care, then townhomes, and then lofts for, this, for the homeless. Formerly homeless people would be living up there, as well as emancipated youth who are coming out of the foster care system at the age of 18. This is going to be their first place to live on their own. So we gave them lofts right on the park. Every unit now has through ventilation, even at 80 units to the acre, except for the few up here that I said were in the double loaded corridor configuration. Uh, everybody else is able, all the families get through ventilation. Um, and, and of course then we get light from both sides, except for those handful of studios that are in the center. We have solar voltaics on the, on the roof that will provide electricity for all the common areas. <clears throat> and then the expression on the outside, we do have a muse along the long side. There's one street here and one street here. I failed to point out, uh, let me go back for a second here. In the site plan, this is going to be another market rate uh, project over here, separated from us by a muse. And this facade is facing the muse. So we have a community center. We have the Museum of Children's Arts outreach program from their main headquarters was originally intended to be here. They can't be here now. They decided not to make the move. So we're trying to find another arts program because the back of that theater, the Fox Theater, is now converted to an arts magnet high school. It's a really cool program. And the, the old theater itself is now a venue for various kinds of music performances. So it's a really rich combination of stuff. There's the muse. And here's uh, that corner where the muse meets uh, 19th Street. So like I said, it's almost finished construction. Uh, there's a number of things that have to be done on the outside, but families are beginning to move in. So the first families are already inside. And on the south side, we have our obligatory you know, sunscreen. But the townhouses then have these stoops and porches. We introduced some tile work at the, at the eye level band and the top band. This is in the Art Deco district of Oakland. There are a lot of interesting old tile buildings, so we introduced some tile. And we have a tile artist who's doing these <coughs> signature tiles on the main columns. Uh, there are 32 of them that wrap around um, the building. And we asked her to try to use the tiles to express the presence of Native American, African, Asian, and Latino Americans who will be living living in here 
Uh, these are before they get glazed. And, and each of them, if you take a closer look, I think this is the Asian one, and this is the Latino one, I think this is the African one, and I think this is the Native American one. And the colors will be reflective of, of the colors of the, of the other tile. Um, this development now is at 100 to the acre. Families, again, mostly families, in Phoenix, along their main corridor, light rail corridor. It'll be a block from uh, a light rail station. The light rail station is not, will, well, the light rail station is now there. This will probably start construction in the uh, fall or spring of next year. Fall of this year or spring of next year. And uh, the way we organize this, on the ground floor underneath here is a parking garage at the back portion of the, of the site. It's ringed by an alley and really a very short dead end street over here. So we didn't mind exposing the garage to those conditions, we're not offending anybody. But in the front under here are two retail shops with a central courtyard on the east side. So that in section, that courtyard is actually four stories tall to let in the east light. Again, the morning light comes into now the group living room. And it's open on the west end as well, but screened from the setting west light, which is very hot. And we get our through ventilation in the courtyard. We get our through ventilation in the units at uh, 100 units to the acre. Did I say, was it 100? 65 on two thirds of an acre. Yes, 100 to the acre. We are relying now on elevators and corridors, but the elevators for the kids stop here for these three bedroom flats, and they stop here one flight up from the courtyard in an open air galleria for these two story townhomes that are three bedroom units. So the kids never have to leave this realm. And then the singles and couples get their double height lofts. They're back to back with the double loaded corridor, but because of the double height, they get the vertical stack ventilation. <clears throat> and then running across this midpoint, we have cables uh, with uh, uh, movable uh, fabric shades. So the courtyard, most of the courtyard, can be in shade through, through the summer months. So the, the lofts up above, the, uh, the two story lofts are up here. Those, th these two floors are the family townhomes, and then these are the family flats, and the retail is down uh, at each of the corners. We'll be hiring a Native American artist to do some kind of metal symbolic thing, sculpture, in, in the great opening on the, on the east side. We'll have our obligatory sunscreens. Charlie Brown's not here. He'd be proud that I, to know that I do follow the sun. <laughs> he thought I never did. Um, and then the, the South, of course, is going to get the benefit. They own this office building, by the way, the nonprofit, and they occupy, the developer occupies the top floor. And then on the west side, we have the smaller aperture uh, that allows for the through, through ventilation of the courtyard, and we have the outdoor space for the singles and couples on the top floor. This is also 100, uh, 100 to the acre, but it's senior housing. This is the one senior development that I'm putting in here simply because to show you that even with senior housing, they can become important landmarks and symbols in a very tough neighborhood. This is a tough drug dealing neighborhood in East Oakland, in San Antonio neighborhood. This is the neighborhood that I live in when I'm down in Oakland. It's one of my houses. And, and we decided, uh, while well, we needed to screen the, the photovoltaics on the roof, and we did that with this crown of glass that we had an artist design uh, up here and backlit it at night and it gets the afternoon sun uh, during the day uh, backlighting it with a with an outdoor uh, screened uh, glass screened in um, a deck off a community room on the top floor, so the seniors can hang out on the top. They get views of the bay, views of the hills to the to the east. But it makes this grand gesture um, ceremonially announcing the importance of seniors in the in the community. And then in the back, because of those long thin sliver sight. We planted it with fruit trees, that's its name, orchards, and, and raised uh, vegetable planters, because a lot of these seniors, and they have already begun to grow vegetables back there. This thing is only about, occupied now about four months, maybe five. Some of the side views from the neighboring bungalow court. We pushed our building to the north so we can get these courts in the south and not impede uh, or not impose ourselves on the low bungalow court to our, uh, to our south. And you can see it in the landscape of this neighborhood. That's a liquor store. 
and during most of the day on the corner there's a taco truck. So, you know, it's an important place in the neighborhood. It's their form of the community center. Um, 92, okay, this is 135 to the acre. I'm getting there, I'm almost there at 150 and then I'll stop and we can have some Q&A. Uh, this is now mostly for house, these don't have a lot of kids. These are ones and twos. And, but to meet the street, we, we put these uh, loft, live work type units and raise the garage up a half a level so that we can create these porches and stoops and separate those units from the street but yet give them the double height to make them more attractive uh, to, uh, to potential buyers. This is for first time homeowners. And uh, the courtyard is only 28 feet wide, 50 feet tall, and the bay windows come together, they're only uh, 22 feet apart. And we were able to get the city planning staff to create a variance to permit this because they were under the, uh, the, the rules said that the courtyard had to be as wide as it, as it is high and there's no way you can get true urban infill densities with that kind of rule. So we got the variance to be a one to two ratio and uh, we actually built a model of this but never showed it to either the planning staff or the client uh, because we knew that when, if they saw it they would never have allowed it because it, it, you know from above in a model it looks like a New York City tenement light well. And we knew that that was not going to work to show them the model. But we knew that once it's done and, and you put in enough of this kind of stuff, the private patios and the trellises and all the plant life, that it would, it would help convince people that you can do that kind of a courtyard. We were in a historic district surrounded by Victorians called Preservation Park. So the historic types forced our hand in this case to make it sort of fit that vocabulary. But literally, uh, one block away. You're, you're looking at it right over here. Uh, there's a park, Jefferson Park, right here. The next project that I'm going to show you is right here, on the other diagonally on the other side of the park. So we're really just like a block away, and and we were able to to do this because we got out from under the thumb of these preservationist types, and then did a contemporary building, uh, more appropriate for the downtown location. Again, for singles and couples, not a whole lot of kids in here, but starter families, these are for first time uh, home buyers or homeowners at 150 to the acre. And again, across the ground floor, because we couldn't afford uh, to put retail there, wouldn't survive, we put in the double height, uh, live work loft, set it back a few feet with a planter, jazz it up a bit, and you can sucker in some young people to want to live there right on street level recently graduated from architecture school. <laughs> and then there's a courtyard in the back on top of the, of the um, uh, garage that gets good west uh, afternoon sunlight. I'll end with this one. This is 150 to the acre. Family housing, again, primarily, uh, 50 units on a third of an acre in the International District of Seattle. It's their, their Asian community. And in, in this one, we did the same trick of Townhouses stacked, because when you stack the townhomes, you get half the number of corridors than if you made stacked flats. So you're cutting down on the number of places where the kids can get into mischief. It's open air, so you can see what they're doing while they're out there. And you're also cutting in half the number of families who have to live above each other by making them two-story towns. So you're getting a number of benefits by doing it, by spending the money on the internal stairs per unit. You're getting a lot of other social benefits out of the deal. And then the singles and seniors are up on the top floor. They get their own deck on the south side, which also allows a little more light into the courtyard. And they can have their world independent of the mayhem that is typically down here with all the kids. So it sits there in the, right in the heart of, of the downtown. Um, and we were fortunate because of this landmark. This is another, here's where a historic landmark is helpful. <laughs> In the other case, we had to lower our density and push some stuff around and lose a little bit of the clinic. Here, because nothing can ever be built above this thing, we have permanent exposure to the south and to views of Mount Rainier. By just pulling the building back five feet from the property line, we can have uh, all the windows uh, we want and true bay windows so that you can really get the views down in, in that direction. So as a building type, it has four sides exposed. And that's what allows us to have um, 150 to the acre with single loaded corridors, 
double aspect units with through ventilation for households that do a lot of steam cooking and stir frying. So it was very important to them that they get the through ventilation. And that's what they love about the, the place. Feedback I'm already getting from the families um, who live there. And then the courtyard, you can see the double height um, uh, between the, the walkways. This is one that's used by the kids for these townhomes. That's the one that's used by the singles and, and couples on the top floor. And then the, 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 uh, the central uh, courtyard, not drainage system. <coughs> so this becomes a racetrack, actually, this, this level. The kids on their tricycles just go zooming around there. So every time I visit, I see how the corners are holding up. So far, so good. Not for long, though, I'm sure. And then finally, this is a mixed-use development, where this is the first one that I'm showing where you're getting uh, middle-income folks living in the same development with very low-income folks. And the middle-income folks are actually a co-housing development. This was a, an, a, an abandoned building. It had been like this for 20 years on this uh, block in downtown Oakland, Swan's Market. Uh, and uh, a private developer wanted to buy all, get all these four lots from the city and develop it as all market rate housing. The nonprofit, the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation, stepped up to the fray and said, "No way, they'll get these three, but they're not getting that one. That should go to a nonprofit trying to serve the larger public good and provide some low income housing." Private developers are going to tear it down and, and build all market rate housing with about 10,000 square feet of retail. The nonprofit has 40,000 square feet. Well, they saved the historic building. They have 40,000 square feet of non-residential stuff, restaurants, uh, offices, the Museum of Children's Art, arts program at the school, arts program, and uh, 40 units of housing. Half of them are, are rental for very low income in the new building, and uh, half of them are the co-housing folks above the parking that we inserted off the street that uh, also serves the convention center. That's a big parking garage here. So we didn't feel bad about lining the street here with the parking garage. We have a restaurant and a restaurant on, on, the, on the two ends. So it's a much more activated street now. We did take a building down behind that facade but left the structure. So we created a central plaza for all kinds of events now. They get choreographed in there through the warm weather months. And the co-housing is what you see in the distance. There's their common house and their front courtyard. So we took away a piece of the building there to create that opening in that courtyard. And then there's a raised dais at the end of the plaza that the kids from MOCA, Museum of Children's Art, use for their dances and their music making and their art, art making uh, when the adults aren't using it for cultural performances but the audience is sitting out here. The market hall is replacing a market hall that got torn down for the market rate housing diagonally across the street. And it's mostly minority vendors who have their stalls in there now, about 11,000 square feet of stuff. Museum of Children's Heart, uh, Art up on the second floor here, and they have a storefront down, down here next to the co-housing front yard. So it's a nice mix of stuff um, and of incomes that would never have been there had it gone the homogenous route of one income only with only 10,000 square feet and no more historic building. <clears throat> that was the original uh, section through the building. We inserted a floor at the 11 foot height to create the parking garage and then built in these two level townhomes within the structure and took the roof off of this piece right around in here. That became the courtyard. The structure, of course, is all still there because that's what's holding up the roofs on both sides of the housing. And we just exposed it as it cuts across the, the, the courtyard. So I'll, I'll end with this slide. There's actually a couple more slides after that, but I might be overstaying my visit here. But I think I might show those other slides as well. <laughs> to tell your captive audience. Um, oops, sorry. Looking at, uh, if I can get back to this one. We look at these two income levels as they reside within the city. And I ask the question, who's more sustainable? Who's living more sustainably? You got a market rate development with 10 stories, 10 units per floor, about 100 units, and they average about 1.75 bedrooms per unit. And the reason for that is the private developers will primarily produce buildings with one and two bedroom units. Maybe a third of them are one bedroom units and thir two thirds are two bedroom units. So that's how you get the bedroom count. You get 175 bedrooms. 
And these 100 units, they average about 1,000 square feet each, typically. The one bedrooms are at 700, the two bedrooms are at 1,100. You throw in the cars and elevators and they're averaging about gross 1,000 square feet each. And for the 200 people, by the way, we count about 1.2 people per bedroom because they're generally childless households. They're singles and couples. Not a lot of families in these market rate towers in any downtown circumstance. So you're getting only about 210 people or you're getting about 476 square feet per person. So in summary, you're getting 100 kitchens, 180 bathrooms, because every one bedroom has a one and a half baths and every two bedroom has two baths. You're getting 175 bedrooms for 210 people. Now down the block is affordable development in wood frame, 50 units only to the acre. So ostensibly, this thing at 100 units to the acre is twice as dense as this right? Because we're just counting units. And when you're counting units, you're only counting kitchens, because that's what defines a unit, is its kitchen. It's telling you nothing about the size of the units, the number of bedrooms, or the number of people in those units. So if you look more closely at the affordable housing, it's only four stories, but it's got two and a half bedrooms per unit, because the affordable housing is usually a combination of twos and threes, about half and half. So you're getting 125 bedrooms for those 50 households. And you're getting more people per bedroom because now you have kids. You're getting about 1.75 people per bedroom. So you're getting about 218 people in these 50 units versus the 210 people in these 100 units. And looking a little bit closer now, these 50 units are also about 1,000 square feet. But they're two and three bedroom units, not one and two bedroom units. So you're getting about 230 square feet per person instead of 476 square feet per person. So in summary, you're getting 50 kitchens, 75 bathrooms, because you get one bathroom in a two, and two bathrooms in a three. So you're getting 75 bathrooms, 125 bedrooms for the 218 people. So in summary, the difference between these two is that the affordable housing, the families living in the affordable housing have 50% fewer kitchens, 60% fewer bathrooms, 30% fewer bedrooms, and 50% less building area for the same number of people. So we should be looking at people per acre and not kitchens per acre when we're talking about density. These folks are living far more sustainably within the inner city than, than these folks are. Plugging into the same infrastructure, you're getting twice as much use and half the amount of resources to, to do it. And in fact, as I said earlier, these folks are living at a house size that's roughly equal to our house size, the average house size in 1950 in the United States, 950 square feet. And the average house size now uh, across the country is, is 2,400 square feet. So we're bloated. We're over-consuming on every level. So when you talk about affordable housing and green living and green architecture, before you get the solar collectors and the sunscreens and the recycled gray water and all those other good materials that are kind to the planet, first look at these numbers and the compaction of the community and the, and the compaction of the resources that make the, the dwelling sizes. That's where you start, because that's 95% of your um, uh, conserving of, of, of resources. So I'm, I'm going to end with a couple of images here. I couldn't, I couldn't, this was a postcard that I photographed years ago and gave it that title. <clears throat> the kind of wealth building that goes on for that top 15% who now caused the crash um, in, the last, um, in the last year. And this is a cartoon right out of mainstream America's press comparing what Osama bin Laden did to New York City and 3,000 people and a minor blip in our economy, and what our own graduates of schools like this did to us and the rest of the world, uh, and then ask for bonuses after having done it. So the contrast between the two, I couldn't help but put this together, and I sent it to our, our new president, Barack Obama, and, and talked about not only the concern for global warming, uh, but the concern for global warming and what's called up there concentrated wealth. Can you guys see this stuff with all these lights on? 
I just realized it's kind of bright in here. And some of you are actually sitting in sunlight. I guess it's rare for you, Jean. Um, <laughs> it's okay. You can sit there. <laughs> and I sent in this proposal to, to, to him, and I'd like to read it to you. It's a few words, but it turns that pyramid upside down that we saw in the first slide. If we could redistribute that 85%, it might start this way. The US must have a policy to economically integrate its communities. There are too many communities with high concentrations of wealthy households. These pathological conditions are breeding too many offspring of the wealthy who engage in criminal behavior that is environmentally and economically destructive to the entire planet. And therefore, we must deconcentrate these ghettos for the rich by importing lower income people or lower income households to provide positive role models. Because of their humble life circumstances, these families can demonstrate higher moral and ethical behavior and the parents engaged in real work can be examples to help steer children of the wealthy away from lives of crimes against humanity. This new program should once and for all reverse those market forces and government programs which have disrupted and destroyed the positive social cohesion found in lower income communities. It's sort of tongue in cheek, but there's a lot more than an ounce of truth in that. And we often see that argument, that argument very willingly put forward, the reverse of it. These low income communities are filled with pathological conditions and malfunctioning human beings, and the only way to solve their problem is to gentrify those neighborhoods by importing people from the middle and upper classes who are much better role models about how to behave as decent human beings. Isn't that a little weird when we see what they've done to us, the people at the top anyway, or what they've done to the rest of us? So <laughs> it's a source of humor, but you know there's some truth in it. We do need to mix these incomes a bit and begin to show the impacts that those guys make with their decisions on the lives of the, of the rest of us. If they saw them every day and not isolate themselves in these, in these uh, uh, suburban uh, gated ghettos. So I'll, I'll end with that, and with this image, you know, what's it, five, six, seven months ago, when Slumdog Millionaire became so popular in, in, in the US, idolizing poverty in a sense, um, and portraying a somewhat romanticized and idealized vision of how poverty, people from poverty can overcome their circumstances and be extraordinary human beings, um, there's a lot of truth to that as much as we can also admit to the fact that it's a bit of a Bollywood ending. You know, does that really happen to people who come out of the ghettos and the slums of countries like, like India? But nonetheless, it touched the hearts of the whole country and the whole world. I mean, this thing was one hell of a popular movie, coming particularly at the time that it did, when the whole world was made aware of just how imbalanced the distribution of resources are and what those few people at the top did to the rest of us. This was kind of a celebration of, you know, we could do it to you too. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's an automatic response. Um, and so I'll, I'll end on, on that. I had a chance to visit. These are photos that I took of the Mumbai slums back in, uh, 15 years ago. I, I went there when I turned 50. I wanted to visit Mumbai. And you saw from those photos, they're wonderful, friendly people and, and not camera shy at all and, and welcomed us as two Californians coming into their, their neighborhoods. They were just tickled pink that we thought it was uh, a wonderful place to, to engage and, and, and photograph. So we br try to bring that spirit to the work that we do. And, and the folks that we meet in the process of those workshops over the years have filled our heads with all kinds of insights about how housing should work. And in return, the little that we can do, and it is very little, as you see, from the magnitude of the need and the amount of little droplets we are putting into this ocean of difficulty by our projects, the best we can do is be poets and artists that we're supposed to be and hold out um, and hold up as examples to others what the world could be like if we could reverse that distribution of wealth and this level of quality can be brought be to everybody, uh, certainly to the 40% who are stuck down there at the bottom with very little wealth or income. So as, as poets, that's the best we can do is show symbols of hope. Um, we're not solving the problem, not even coming close to it. But we can keep alive the dream that maybe someday we can bring this level of quality to, to, uh, to everybody. And this is our crew. Uh,
about two years ago anyway, um, when we had a beach party in order to chill out after a particularly heavy work, work period, stress, stressful work period. These are the guys who do all the work. I'm just a front mouthpiece. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I, just, sorry, I know you're a big proponent of uh, taking, uh, allocating some money to the non-built environment, a lot of these situations, doing things like social programs, the community. Um, I was you know, looking at your buildings there, and you know, they're really, really beautiful. Um, but a lot of like bay windows and uh, you know, very attractive features. I was wondering, how do you balance uh, between uh, money that could be spent potentially on sort of programs and architecture. Yeah. They come from two different streams, those sources of funds. So when we're spending money on buildings, it's not necessarily taking it from the money that has been set aside for the social programs. They come from two different allocations. And then within our allocation for the buildings, um, just after years of experience, we know where to spend the dollars where they will make the most impact in the everyday lives of the residents. You don't spend it on the systems that no one sees. I mean, we do it to code. We're seismically proper, and our plumbing works, and all the electrical systems work. But engineers tend to be conservative, so you have to really watch them like a hawk, because they could be spending money that they really don't have to be spending, which is why all of our projects are done in, with uh, uh, three people at the table, the client, us, and the contractor, right from the start of the design. When we're working with the community and coming up with the general concepts, right at that stage, when we have that general concept, we have the contractor already begin to prepare an estimated preliminary concept budget. And we have constant monitoring and, and uh, uh, budget uh, or cost estimating done throughout the process working with the contractor. And that helps us to make sure that those systems that no one ever sees but are essential to life aren't absorbing too much of the budget because we want it to be put into the cabinets and the countertops and the, and the carpeting and, the, and the, the hardware and the bay windows and the trellises and the nice gates and fences and the five color, ten color schemes and the tiles and the sunscreens and, and all that stuff that everybody sees and, and takes you know, some delight in. Um, I, I was I think it's a good question, but uh, it, are, do your projects usually fall within budget? I mean, has, is that, yeah. is that a good question? Uh, yeah. <laughs> by, the, by, by the time we're done with it, we're usually within 3% of the target budget, or we're either right on or within 3%. The only time where we had trouble with that is when everybody else was having trouble. Um, during, the, the, during the 90s, when the cost of construction went through the roof, Everybody was blaming China because they were consuming 60% of the steel and, I don't know, 80% of the concrete and all this other stuff. Uh, prices went through the roof. And no matter how many cost estimates we made along the way, they proved to be wrong in the end, and we were like 10% over. And, and then at that point, you do two things. You start value engineering out the things that really are not necessarily essential to the life of the place, and the nonprofit goes out and tries to raise some additional funds. Now, during this period, everything's coming in 10 to 15% under budget because everybody's hungry out there. Subs and general contractors are scrambling to, to get the work. Uh, we just had a $2 million savings on a, on a, uh, a $17 million project, student housing at, at UC Merced. And now we're putting it back into higher quality, all kinds of fi finishes. And, turning all the wood trellises into steel trellises so they'll be maintenance free over the years, or a lot less maintenance than they would be if they had to be wood, which is what we thought they would have to be. So we're doing a lot of things now, throwing things back in because we're, we're under budget because of the time. So a lot of times, the, whether it's on or over or under budget has to do with the broader economic conditions and not too much really with the, with the building that we're actually designing. But that doesn't let us off the hook. You have to be constantly vigilant. Yes. I really loved your clear explanation that comes from the many years of working in these building types. And can you explain more about that schmaltz and the schmutz? Because I was really interested in those times when we had the pedestrian court and the auto court. And I was wondering how you keep the clarity of the back and the front. Right. And then in the courtyard schemes above the garage, there's no back, there's no schmutz, right? 
Right, right, right. Yeah, right. right. yeah. I, I put this talk together to start at 30 to the acre and go up from there. So we're out of the schmutz world once we're in those levels of density because you're not getting the kind of backsides that you can get at the, at the lower densities. Uh, a lot is exposed to the public realm. But we do get those inner courtyards. And in those inner courtyards, the intensity of the life at the courtyard level, which will be totally dominated by the kids, um, those places are going to look very, very lived in within a matter of two years because you've got you know, 50, 100, 200 uh, very experienced deconstructors of the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's their job in the world. Well, we always try to get doors on the street, multiple inches, lots of townhouses lining the uh, lower floors of a, of a high density building so we can get lots of stoops and porches. You're getting lots of attention then on that street. Instead of a building that has only one entrance and everybody just looks at the street, you can actually go out and do something about something that might be going on out there. So and we don't have problems with that. You, you, what, your, your concern is that with those... Some of them, they just had a major gate or two, and I was just wondering, did they have retail or garages? Oh, yeah. In those developments that had retail all across the bottom, it's a boulevard, and it's very hard to put families on the boulevard. So we we, those were lined with retail uh, or artists. They have their own entrances. But, you know, artists are a different breed. They'll live anywhere if the price is right. Yes? I was curious what AMI stood for. Do you have that on the Area of Median Income. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Um, in those developments where you had um, the possibility for entrepreneurship mm -hmm. spaces down below, are there programs with the government agencies and nonprofits that you're working with to help the folks that are moving in there get that set up? Or how effective is that been? Unfortunately, no. Um, in the case, in, in both those cases, they were, they were homeowner projects. And so uh, they have a little more freedom to be able to do that. In the one case, the z in both cases, the zoning permits it. So they're not going to get in trouble with the authorities for, for running a business out of their home. Uh, in the rental developments, I don't, I don't know of any management company that likes the idea that the renters are going to use a portion of their um, unit to be silk screening t-shirts 24 hours a day or, or making plaster statuettes that they sell at curio shops or uh, that they might actually be uh, repairing electronic equipment as a business and the place is just filled with other people's uh, uh, gear. M uh, the, the rental management companies don't like to see that happen. And that's the biggest impediment. And so we, we'll design it into the unit and be quiet about it. And it's generally, the strategy is after you come in the door, you try to get a bedroom right off the front door so that if you do have customers coming in and out doing whatever it is that you do, they don't have to invade the rest of the house. And you might even be a separate door then into the rest of the apartment. Um, you try to slip it in under the radar. And you don't call it out. You just set up the conditions that if somebody got the light bulb and said, ah, I think I can use that for, you know, I can get six sewing machines in there and get my buddies over here and we'll make, pe we'll do piece work for Gap, for the Gap. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's another hand up. Yeah. Yeah. This is more of a site specific question, but um, given all your work that you've done in areas like East Oakland and International Boulevard and, and Free Fail as well, um, are there, have there been any major social obstacles that you've had to deal with in development of these uh, projects? The only place we ever run into any serious opposition is in wealthy communities. In these low-income communities that you just mentioned, the only resistance might come a little bit from the local minority, lower-income homeowners for the same reason and worried about their investment. This is their only wealth that they have. You know, they're part of that bottom sliver. Uh, and so they may get a little concerned. But as soon as they get involved with the workshops and they understand that the nonprofit is a good one and with a good management company and that we really are listening to what they are saying and we're trying to work in their concerns into the design, 
And then when they hear about what the rents will be, they realize this is housing for their kids and their nephews and nieces. And so, OK, yeah, we're, we're with you. But in communities like Palo Alto, we just spent almost a year with the neighborhood group there trying to get in a 35-unit SRO, studios only, 400 square foot studios, again, for working singles and uh, some emancipated youth, 18-year-olds coming out of foster care. Um, and, and that neighborhood put us through the ringer. I mean, that building is going to cost over $300 a square foot to build. Now, part of that is simply because it's a small project to begin with, and it's going to cost more. And when you've got 35 units with only 400 square feet, you've got a lot of kitchens and bathrooms per square foot. And those are the two most important ingredients of any home. So uh, in a typical apartment building where you have 1,000 square feet with kitchens and bathrooms, here we have 400 square feet each with kitchen and bathroom. It does bring the price up no matter what. But they layered onto us requirements. This building is carved up with roof terraces and bay windows. It's got all kinds of gizmos on it uh, to satisfy the, the local neighbors. And, and of course, now it's, it, it is accepted. And it's going to take a lot of doing to get the financing in place to, to accomplish that. But then again, on another neighbor in Palo Alto, it sailed through in Professorville, and where the homes were even more expensive than the neighbor that I just described. And they were not afraid of a tax credit rental development in their midst. They participated in the, in the workshops. They loved the design. It's a big hit. It's always used in Palo Alto as an example of how you can get low-income rental housing into a high-end ownership neighborhood. But of course, we did have a lot of professor types in the audience who are a bit more progressive and open-minded, and they weren't as fearful about what was going to happen to their neighborhood. Uh, I, there was a hand up in the back. Do you participate in post-occupancy evaluations? We have not done it in a formal way. We, we often make uh, trips to our developments maybe six months out with the whole team, and we walk the site with the resident manager, and she or he usually gives us an earful about what's working, what's not working. And we take notes, and we take it seriously, and we try to bring it back to our future uh, projects. We are now at the point, I, I've always wanted to write a book about our work. And I wanted to write up about 30 case studies of projects now that are five years plus old. And um, I'm debating whether I write the book, because I would love to do it over a two-year period, go back and interview all these folks, and write up the stories about each of the developments. But uh, people will feel it's biased, and it probably will be. It's going to be seen through my glasses, not through some third party. So I'm thinking now that uh, we should uh, work with two or three academic types, uh, environmental psychology types, whoever, you know, the kinds who really do research, that kind of research, uh, interviewing research, like a Lynn Manzo from the University of Washington, or Sherry Aronson down at Florida Center, or, um, um, or others like that. And then they could get grants for it. It'll be a, univers a university-based study of 30 of our projects, and they can write up whatever they find out. And we don't care, because that's going to be very useful to others in the industry doing this kind of housing for the next decade or two. And we'll supply them with the graphics, the plans, the photos. We will do no editing, um, other than to make sure that it's in plain English and not academies, so it really is understood by the general public. No offense. Howard. <laughs> I know it's going to be a very legible, readable book. I know. <laughs> yeah. In the same developments? Um, it all depends on the income spread. If it's within the same building, I think the spread between 80% of median and on up is doable. Once you drop down to 60, 50, 40% of median, you're getting uh, families that have lots of issues that have to be dealt with. They need childcare, they need social services, they need adult education, they need job training. And no private developer is going to offer that. And so trying to mix those incomes into the same building and financing package is not easy to do. Putting them side by side on the same street, yeah. This is owned and operated by a nonprofit with its, its social service enriched programs. And right next to it is a market rate high end condo. And they're integrated because they're in the same neighborhood. 
they're using the same streets and using the same shops, like Pike Place Market in uh, Seattle or Pioneer Square. You got million dollar condos right next to the lowest of low incomes for SROs where people are struggling to overcome substance abuse problems right on the same street. So that kind of integration I think is very doable, um, but trying to mix it in, in the same building, that, that spread of income, I don't think it's, it's real. Yeah. In regards to the internet space, what um, is the economics of the sweet spot? Going up different stories, having elevators, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, the cost per square foot. And sometimes you just have to ignore where the sweet spot is because you simply have to get more people in the inner city. And it will cost you more once you escalate to that point of having the car, the elevators and the corridors and the fire stairs you are going to be spending more per square foot to make a building like that function properly. Um, now presumably we'll get, be getting more units out of it. Once you get over the 50 per acre, you're beginning to depend on those devices. And so it will cost you a bit more. But on the other hand, you're getting that many more people utilizing the existing infrastructure and the existing bus system so you're getting lots of economies of scale in other areas that are not usually measured simply by looking at the cost of the building. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. The cities like San Francisco were practically emptied out the middle class families. Is there any these nonprofits that are trying to control Yeah. Yeah. There are a number of nonprofits that operate in San Francisco. We don't do any work over there, one or two projects in our whole career, because we're based in Oakland. And San Francisco, every pro affordable housing project in San Francisco has money from the Mayor's Office of Housing. And they have a strict policy that you cannot, uh, your design team must come from San Francisco. You know, they're very provincial that way. That doesn't happen in Oakland. We have to compete with San Francisco based firms to get our projects in Oakland but we can't get them in San Francisco, so we write it off. So I don't know as much about it, but I do know there are a number of families over there, uh, a nonprofit who are producing family, housing, affordable family housing. Very expensive to do, because the land is very expensive, and they are having to go to taller and taller concrete frame buildings to do their family housing. And, and they're, they're the highest cost per square foot for family housing than anywhere else in, in, in the country. It's even higher than New York. But they are doing it. But that's the low income. The middle class, on the other hand, no one's doing it for the families there. The market rate stuff is, you know, the, San Francisco b is being bloated with air, which is what these studio loft apartment buildings are or condo buildings are. They're more air than they are square footage because of all the double height space to be seductive to get all those singles to feel their hip in the inner city. You're getting fewer people per acre by doing that. Because not only are you appealing only to one and two person households, you're decreasing the amount of square footage that could exist within that zoning envelope because you're dedicating it to the double height volume. So they're actually <laughs> they're diminishing the capacity uh, of, the, of the city by, by catering to that group only. Um, and no one's paying attention to three bedroom units for, for families in the middle class. Yeah. Oh. Someone who didn't ask us. Okay. Um, in writing to Obama and so forth about um, its redistribution of wealth, have you made any calculations in your own mind about perhaps what the social housing need and the kind of scale of change in this country? And you look at your plan. Yeah. We still have yeah, 20, 30 percent of uh, city housing and social. Uh, right. Housing. You always drool when you look at the European examples because there's so much of it, and the investment is taken seriously really high quality buildings. Some of my students now in the seminar class that I'm teaching in, in Portland, uh, part of their exercise is to look at other countries to see what their so-called social housing or subsidized housing uh, is like. And you know, it just puts us to shame. The high quality of the materials, the thoughtfulness of, of the, the, the planning, it just, it's, it's sickening. <laughs> I, I drool when I look at that work and wish I, was born in a different country. Um, but what it, what it could be like, yeah, we could have such higher quality. Uh, the, the, the market rate 
would have to start mimicking what we do, aspire towards what we do, if we really had a serious uh, government investment uh, in that bottom uh, 40%. And even with what we do now, I was mentioning that, I think last night uh, in Portland, uh, when, the, when you go to these awards programs, housing awards programs, and, and there's always a category for affordable along with the market rate. The market rate developers are always stunned when the slides come up for the ones that have won the awards in the affordable housing category because <laughs> they look better often than the stuff that won the awards in the market rate stuff. And, and they realize that, well, um, they don't quite try as hard as they could. They invest their money in the sizzle stuff to attract the, uh, a lot of nonsense to, to make to what they think is appealing to the market um, to make it more attractive. And, and they're not really looking at the more substantive things they could be doing to make these places more livable. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, folks.